Good morning. My name's uh, Mark Rendell, also known as Marcos, and I'm going to talk about scaling up DevOps adoption. So I'm going to cover quite a few different approaches that we've found very effective in terms of enabling and really empowering teams uh, on their DevOps journeys. And just to keep kind of my adrenaline levels up, I'm going to try not one, but two live demos. But the good news is they're completely fail-safe, so uh, you know, we can all relax and, uh, and have a good time. So I wanted to start by uh, just kind of providing a bit of context uh, as to where I'm coming from. So um, I work with Accenture, I'm part of the Global DevOps Capability Group. So that's actually about 5,000 people globally uh, where we're working to help enable uh, implementation of DevOps. And um, people think um, I'm a consultant. Uh, of course, I do consultancy, but there's actually a large amount of delivery uh, in the work that we do from a, a day to day uh, in, in our group. So when we're thinking about scaling adoption, there's kind of three different ways. Uh, we, we, of course, we partner with clients, and we love doing that, and we help them on uh, their de DevOps transformation journey from maturity assessments through initial implementation, pilots, scaling, all that kind of stuff. We do a lot of uh, work with our group on engagements where Accenture are doing DevOps or, or doing delivery. So, for example, uh, an integration platform for an investment bank. We will be, of course, wanting to do DevOps by default and putting the tools in um, as we do things um, on that journey. And then, of course, uh, we also feel like we have a, 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 an obligation to help wider people beyond the number of engagements we can actually work on in Accenture. Um, so, to, for example, to train people within, uh, within our company and uh, to enable them with tools and things like that to try and, uh, to try and help them. So I'm, I'm sort of hoping that um, many of you are within your organizations are also in a situation similar to mine where you're wondering and, and you're working very hard to scale DevOps, so some of the uh, within your organizations. So uh, when you hear some of the things that we've done to try and scale in our organization, hopefully it will be interesting. So I don't think I'd be very popular um, in 2018 if I started into some kind of like deep dive of what DevOps is. Um, but I do think, uh, I do want to stress that I think these days it's really about creating safety along with speed. And uh, actually, um, I think this is what possibly the slide should look like in, in 2018. Um, so we've now embraced uh, SEC or security as part of the portmanteau, which I think is uh, a good thing. And we're also looking at the, the uh, inspiration from the Google book, uh, Site Reliability Engineering, SRE. Um, have some good things to say about how Google um, sort of have done DevOps in their organization. Uh, if you haven't read the book, that would be my sort of first piece of advice. I think it's a, a very interesting uh, read to see how they've kind of really defined some of the things they're doing. But seriously, I actually think that the, the speed part is not the hardest part of the challenge these days. So um, I don't know if you saw that a few months ago, Amazon released uh, blueprints for creating a blockchain um, just at a, pretty much a single click in the cloud. So you could basically sort of start now and have a cryptocurrency going by lunchtime. Um, you know, don't do it on the conference Wi-Fi, um, although it is very good. But, um, but seriously, though, it, is, it is quite easy to create things uh, quickly these days. So the emphasis has really shifted um, to security. How, how do we deal with the proximity that developers have got to at least, at very least, the cloud, if not, if not production these days. How do we deal with the fact that we're doing automation at bigger and bigger scale, you know, very in, in production, and with more and more people potentially with uh, ability to write that and start using it? How do we deal with the? How can we be responsible at this speed in terms of risk and sort of business uh, business levels of risk, security, uh, compliance, uh, conforming to regulation, and all that kind of stuff? So these are some of the things that. I think about when we're thinking about scaling DevOps. And if I was to sort of, um, in my head, the way I sort of think, um, probably um, a, a reasonable way of describing sort of DevOps adoption across, across all industries, um, is sort of a bit like this quote from William Gibson. So um, actually, if I sort of fudge it a little bit, so um, DevOps is already at most organizations. It's just not evenly adopted yet. And, you know, if we accept the, the sort of transformative uh, business uh, benefits and impact from doing something like DevOps and speeding IT up um, massively and making it um, much better at serving the business, then 
um, you know, we can accept that it, it sort of partial is not enough. Now, uh, forgive me, um, we are at a sort of, well, so somewhat music venue here, or also I, I, I hear they do some sport here as well. Um, so I'm going to try a sort of music-based metaphor, because I love music. So um, um, well, if we're scaling up DevOps and we're thinking about just one um, or, or sort of small pockets, it's kind of like we're taking a musician out of a big band, like say a jazz band or something, and, and just working with them and, and neglecting the rest of the group. So, um, of course, you realize that um, King Curtis is, uh, is not part of a, a big band jazz. He, was, he played rhythm and blues. But um, so if we take King uh, Curtis out of his group, and you know, he's the saxophone player, and start working with him, we might improve his technique. We might improve um, his uh, sort of phrasing. We might sort of teach him a new sort of style of music. And um, we might um, teach him some new songs. Okay, but it's only going to be very localized value. And uh, when we sort of take that in back to the rest of the group, um, there's, a, there's a diminished um, sort of benefit there. They're not going to be any, any good at sort of playing the new songs with him or anything like that. And um, so I just think that we have to focus on much more widely and, um, and bring that success uh, to everyone. Now, the challenge here is that it may not be quite so easy when we start to try and repeat the success. We might have started somewhere which is kind of quite compatible um, with, what, with what we're doing. Um, we, might, we might then find, you know, that the, the, whatever we did with the, the saxophone player just doesn't work for the drummer. It just doesn't apply there. Um, maybe we'll find the learning curve is harder for other, other areas of, of the group. Or um, we might find that their sort of level of uh, attitude to risk is different. Then maybe they're much more prominent and, um, and they're not kind of comfortable operating in this new way. Um, okay, the, taking this a bit too far, maybe they're part of some kind of union um, where there's like a regulatory body that's just saying, look, you just can't do this new style. This is just too much. So, and, and finally, I mean, the, the effort that we put in when we were working with, with one musician, um, probably we felt like we had enough resources at the time. We had enough uh, sort of ability to do that. But when we're trying to do that on scale across everyone, um, it really gets a lot more difficult. So really, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, that, that is kind of the, uh, the, my sort of metaphor for our challenge. You know, we are looking at repeating the success where it can be a lot harder and, and working out how to do that at scale, because you know, I maintain it's very important. So you know, getting started has been made um, quite easy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced this course with um, great tools like Jenkins and, um, and SonarType. Um, it really does um, help you to get started with things like building pipelines, like building uh, continuous delivery, and continuous integration, and continuous delivery pipelines, and kind of going left to right, taking, taking bits of, say, application code and adding more and more gates. And, and then we can start going down the stack as well. And I kind of think about this uh, sort of on a per application, kind of put per musician basis of a sort of simple maturity model. So how many automated steps or how far across can we go left to right? And then how far down the stack can we go as well? Can we automate just the application? Or can we look at the environments, the infrastructure provisioning, uh, you know, as far as IaaS, uh, if you're in the public cloud, or even further down? So these are, these are things that are quite good for getting started. But for me, um, we also need to think how far across the organization we can go as well. So there's kind of like another dimension here, which is, um, you know, how, how much have we repeated that success? How, how widely can we, can we go? So it's actually reasonable to ask, you know, how much can we influence this centrally? So perhaps some of this initial success we've had was down to the autonomy that we gave the initial teams. Maybe we sort of set them free from, or you know, gave them some dispensation from certain processes. Maybe we gave them the sort of uh, superstar kind of uh, um, hybrid team. And we looked at how different ways that we could, um, uh, could so, so, so give them that autonomy to, be, um, to, to achieve the things they've, they've achieved. Now, we'll see it'd be a pretty short keynote if I was like, no, it's too hard, we can't do it. Um, you know, I, do, I do think that um, there are actually plenty of ways of enabling and empowering teams um, without um, sort of stifling them and, and keeping that sort of success. So it's, it's reasonable to ask why. You know, why, why should we try and centrally affect this and why, why do we need it? Um, of course, there's sort of reasons um, which just you know, always apply everywhere. So if, of course, we want to cut costs. There's definitely kind of uh, 
diminished returns from having too much sort of proliferation of different tools. Um, we want to give teams autonomy, but it just doesn't make sense to have too many different ways of doing the same thing within an organization. Too many people learning the same things over and over again and ending up with um, sort of silos within across the teams where you just can't, you don't, you don't have a common tool set, you don't have a common language, you don't have common skills across people. And you know, inevitably that is going to cut costs by, by scaling and improving operational efficiency. So the next thing is um, repeating success. So of course, if we've done it successfully somewhere, we started feeling the benefit and maybe you know, business expectations are going up, we need to be able to do that elsewhere. But finally, and this is what gets me kind of really excited about doing this is, uh, and it's really what I've witnessed, is that as you start scaling, you start to get this sort of positive reinforcement by different teams that are collaborating or sharing their, their successes. So the kind of real benefit you can get sort of goes up the more, the more scaling you're doing it. And it's like the thing from uh, science where we talk about standing on the shoulder of giants. You know, you're, you're building on top of all of the experiments and all of the, uh, all of the research and the sort of knowledge that's come before you. And if we can foster that within an organization, it's actually very, very exciting because sometimes large scale is seen as a slight problem, you know, being unwieldy and maybe not agile by having a very large organization. But actually, we can turn that into a competitive advantage if we can work out how to share and how to reinforce all the different uh, DevOps things that people are doing, all the different things that we can uh, reuse from each other and inform each other and share um, internally. So I would think this is important because this is kind of where I'm coming from. So um, uh, you know, I sort of have this incredible uh, challenge of working uh, for an organization that works in over 100 countries, uh, 40, uh, or over 40 industries. There's actually over 400,000 people in our organization. So to me, that really is a sort of an opportunity for sort of reali realizing the benefits of scaling. And when I think about uh, my sort of day-to-day -day, uh, life, I'm seeing things like this. So lots of kind of different teams doing, solving completely different business problems with completely different technology stacks. And I'm wondering, you know, how do we, how do we scale DevOps across that? But actually, it looks more, a lot more like this, so, or probably you know, even further zoomed out. So really vast opportunities, uh, from my perspective, of reuse and positive reinforcement and, and accelerating innovation by people sharing. So if we think about a sort of typical example, and this is a, a, a sort of pluck this from something from last year, we can, uh, we can look at sort of what great looks like and then start thinking about, well, how do we scale those different things across the organization, you know, responsibly, uh, putting the emphasis on, uh, on safety as well as speed. So in this particular example, uh, we had a tool, uh, tool set on the top left, uh, top that side, um, which is um, very reminiscent of what you'd expect, especially today. So uh, sort of Jenkins powered, end-to-end -to -end tool set, um, all the way to production. And we had things in there for collaboration, we had things in there for storing, uh, software and, and, and sort of vitally scanning software as well. We had a nice um, modern architecture, so loosely coupled, uh, sort of microservices based, uh, new architecture which uh, lots of people are sort of also wanting to do. And that gave us uh, the ability to sort of move, change things in, in, in isolation at speed. Had a very metrics uh, driven approach throughout the whole life cycle. So from uh, the performance of the, or the quality of the software, the security profile of the software, how things are behaving uh, uh, in production, and taking a sort of hypothesis-driven uh, appro approach as well. So tracking features and working out how we might measure those features when they're in production to see whether they were, the features were good or not, and feeding that back as well. So very, very sort of strong, in this case, uh, there was sort of Splunk-based dashboards for understanding how this particular system is doing. So good practices like uh, trunk-based development, so um, absolutely minimizing branches. This engagement literally has just, just one branch and uh, our ability to fix forward all the time without branching. Scanning, security in the life cycle, and a, a, a brilliant platform. So in this case, it was uh, Kubernetes on AWS uh, using uh, OpenShift, OpenShift 3. So all of this kind of stuff moving at speed with a very solid foundation. And as I say, the challenge that, that really interests me is how do we start uh, repeating this with the, in the most sort of efficient way possible. 
So I can kind of walk around uh, uh, these things one by one. So starting with the tools. Now, you know, some of us really love working with tools, and it's um, and is, it is very interesting to keep uh, kind of experimenting and trying new things. But fundamentally, to each different team in an enterprise, there's probably diminished returns by them doing too much of their own kind of analysis on tools it, when it's kind of kind of solved and it's probably been solved many times within the uh, enterprise in terms of what what a good set of tools for working in a particular context is right now, and so. No, so they don't necessarily need to spend a long time choosing the tools. And it's probably not differentiating to them either if they start self-managing them. So what we came up with um, that's really working for us is giving people choice, but um, giving them potential opinions they can use if they want. So the two, um, you know, we're all about uh, acronyms. So uh, ADOP and AMAP are our two different choices. So um, ADOP uh, stands for Accenture DevOps Platform. Um, which um, you know we've open sourced. Uh, there's the link here, and uh, we named this one first. Hence, it was called the DevOps platform. The next one was called the Mon- Modern Engineering Platform, and um, the ADOP is predominantly open source tools based. Um, so um, Jenkins, Git, uh, things like that, and um, AMEP is predominantly Microsoft tools based. Obviously, after the news of yesterday, uh, this uh, <laughs> um, this taxonomy is becoming blurry. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, um, MEP is predominantly um, the sort of um, team foundation services, that sort of thing, based versus Jenkins based. So we create these two platforms, create training, make it very, very easy to provision them. But we still don't want to actually force them on people because whatever context they could be, they could be in something completely cloud native or something mainframe based or whatever it is, they always retain the, the, the complete freedom to go their own way. And and you know that, that that if that makes sense for them, then that's fine. But we've also wanted to make it as low, you know, the, the barrier to adoption of some of our sort of suggested standards as low as possible. So we've made it as easy as possible to provision them. And as I say, we've open sourced um, ADOP so that anyone uh, without talking to us um, can literally go to GitHub and, and provision it. Um, you know, it, even our clients. And there's many many instances out there that I don't know about um, you know, from the DevOps practice. And that's, and that's completely fine. So um, and, uh, internally, um, MEP is also, again, open source. So very easy for people to provision whether they want to talk to us or not. But as I said, it's not necessarily a kind of differentiator for them by provisioning it, um, especially if they're, say, working in SaaS or something like that, and they don't really need to get involved in IaaS in the cloud or that, at that level in the stack. Um, it, they might much prefer for us to provision it uh, for them. So we do that. And then they still may want to manage it, or they might want to give it to us to manage as well. So, so I have a, um, a team who are centrally managing lots and lots of different dedicated instances and giving people um, kind of complete autonomy. Um, but actually through, uh, you know, actually a big way enabled by, by Jenkins Enterprise, we're also able to create a SaaS. And that is the sort of lowest barrier to adoption where people can come to us and get uh, all of the tools, and it really doesn't take um, uh, take much for them to get them. So um, yeah, it is really um, you know 100% uh, self-service. They will literally enter a sort of internal charge code and get access to a, a Jenkins master and some Jenkins slaves, a, a private area in Bitbucket, private spaces in Confluence. A private project in um, Sonar Cube, a um, space for the Nexus lifecycle, all of these kind of good things. So uh, we're just going to have a kind of quick look at that um, now. So uh, this is uh, this is Joe uh, from my team. So Joe's using this stuff um, day in day out. So uh, so yeah, this is our, our self service portal. So it's, this isn't open to the outside world, but we are starting to implement more instances of this because you know this has been as far as we've got um, to the in our journey in terms of making things self service. So people go to a portal, and there's various ways to get it sort of help. And um, they can just choose. Um, so if they want to choose a, um, a dedicated instance, that's not sort of fully automated now, but it's still a, it's a single way to get it if they want it. Um, but they can also um, click to get a, um, a sort of slice across all these tools in a sort of SaaS way. So um, some people, actually, the way they get started is they just want Jira and Confluence for collaboration. Um, and, that, and some people will always will still want to kind of use their own tools for their sort of CI/CD stack, as it were. Uh, all, all people will choose the, the what we call the development bundle, and um, 
then they can uh, then they literally just sort of start putting their their details in. Um, so um, um, some of the things in here um, we um, uh, aren't fully um, automated, so we don't need to necessarily um, provision uh, say the source lab stuff um, straight away. So we give people a bit of lead time on that and actually uh, uh, you know give them a chance to get started with Jenkins and uh, and and Git um, almost um, almost straight away. So they can choose uh, where they are. We even capture a bit of information about them to help um, to help us kind of contact them. And then they get to set up their own security. So we, we of course, want them to have uh, privacy and, uh, and, want to, and want to tap into our directory, enterprise directory. We don't want to be managing uh, users for people, so they need to create groups, and, and that's how they will um, um, work out the different levels in our sort of standard permission model and get themselves access to this. And um, then they can, um, how much further are we going? Uh, not much further. Not much further. So, um, so yeah, so that will take them through. And now, and now in a true Blue Peter style, um, what they end up getting is something a bit like this. So, again, it's designed to be sort of purely self service, but they'll get to see the links to all of their tools and they'll get to add other services as well. So, um, you know, they may want to add more Jenkins Masters or things like that, um, or they might want to. Um, um, or they might want to add uh, you know, more space to Confluence. Or, uh, we've actually made our OpenShift available this way as well. So, they, so this is their sort of self-service place to get non-production environments, but a, but a space to start creating their environments and experimenting in that way. So that's kind of the first way that we've uh, enabled people. So that's kind of interesting around the tools. But what we're finding was people would then actually starting to do the same things, thanks Joe, uh, starting to do the same things again and again. So after they got the tools, they were then thinking about, oh, you know, how do I, um, how do I build a pipeline? How do I get started with a sort of reference architecture or something like that? And we didn't want that. We didn't want people to be then, you know, figuring out which plugins to add or, or literally how to, how to work with the technology they're working with. So uh, from various places, including uh, 1990s, uh, games consoles, we stole the concept of cartridge. And uh, so the, the platform being the console and the uh, cartridge being the plugin. And, um, and what we've created in this is basically a packaging format for automation and example code. And that was very, very powerful for us because it gave us the ability to say, right, you've got some example uh, source code, you've got some example uh, maybe test data, some example infrastructure code, some example automated tests for anywhere in the pipeline, and then you've got pipelines to do that um, in Jenkins and you want to be able to you want to be able to load those in and you want to be able to, to get to a point where you can make a change or just manually trigger the pipeline and have stuff creating in front of you and so we started we started doing this started creating them um, really the best way that we knew how for each technology we sort of invested in a few sort of simply things like JavaScript Java and uh, as I say we started with with what we knew so we found a way, you know, obviously we put things like static code analysis in there, automated uh, security testing of the, of the source code, and then um, we, an automated deployment, an automated uh, using things like OWASP, ZAP, putting in a security scanning in the pipeline, doing an example with uh, BDD, so using something like Cucumber and demonstrating that in action. Maybe even going as far as an AB uh, deployment into production. So that when people start with these technologies, rather than sort of figuring these things out again and again, we've given them a really, uh, you know, what we know at the time, the best way to do it. And then, of course, they can then uh, feed back on top, and we can keep improving these over time and um, sort of, um, you know, scale the, the sort of innovation. So, as I say, we started building them, and then we realized we were becoming a bottleneck. We didn't want to centralize this, so we sort of open source the cartridge format, uh, of course, and do regular uh, sort of, uh, workshops to teach people to do this, and that's allowed this stuff to sort of really spread out. And it's been um, you know, it's been very inspiring because we've we've got something somewhere between 50 and 100 of these different cartridges across all different technologies. You know, things like deploying uh, COBOL, COBOL code to Microfocus, all the way to sort of uh, um, also snazzy things like um, like blockchain um, projects or Converse, which is a voice thing. So we have these kind of kind of uh, starting points for all these different technologies which people are sharing with. 
We took exactly the same idea for environments, basically. We, uh, we knew that we wanted to be able to not just have pipelines for the applications, but they needed to be able to deploy somewhere and do all of that kind of thing. So, again, we started with sort of um, platforms or languages like Chef, Ansible, Terraform, showing how you lint these things, figuring out how you can put some uh, sort of opinionated security test in there against the code, figuring out how you might want to use something like test kitchen and inspec or server spec when you provision things to start looking at that. And you know, it's a case of, of figuring this stuff out uh, once and then, and then people sharing and building on top of that. Um, so that we had kind of good ways that when, when someone would, would pick up Ansible for the first time, they wouldn't be sort of discovering the same things again and again. You know, how do I manage secrets? Uh, how many uh, Git repos should I use for this? What's the granularity? They could see, um, of course, the example um, Ansible code, um, Chef code, all these things. There's plenty of modules out there, but also how we do that pipeline for them as well. And we went sort of slightly up the stack as well, I guess. So we started thinking about specific environments for specific technologies. We don't just want everyone to, um, to then, in the same way, create um, something with uh, Ansible, say, you know, some kind of uh, uh, middleware. We wanted to have the example for that. And we, we, we took this as far as things like SAP environments, um, so really quite complex stuff. But again, we're packaging up this automation and making it easy to share. And Cloud providers you know, um, have some of these examples. And I mentioned the, the blockchain thing earlier, the kind of blueprints that you get in cloud providers. But to me, that's kind of like giving someone a fish rather than teaching them how to fish. Because when you take the automation in this format, you get it with you know, a solid as a, as a rock kind of Jenkins pipeline and, um, and a continuous delivery process for evolving that code. So rather than provisioning something and then finding out how to SSH to it and then uh, going sort of backwards, you start by getting the source code, getting the tests, and knowing that there's a sort of safe environment for starting to make these changes and evolve the code. So, um, yeah, sorry, Joe, I changed the uh, order a little bit. Joe, I'll just give you a, uh, quickly show you the, uh, uh, the, the sort of experience for people in terms of uh, browsing for these different um, cartridges and, um, and adding them. So, yeah, people are sort of adding these all the time, and then... Um, they, uh, obviously, there's a pull request model for, for enhancing this. And uh, you know, it's a way of sort of leveraging scale, which I think is uh, sort of an, ex an exciting part of scaling uh, DevOps. So that was the tools and uh, infrastructure code. The next thing I want to talk about is scaling the, uh, the metrics. So of course, we're in a sort of situation here where the more our opinions are used about our tools and the more it's a sort of standard predictable stack to us, uh, the more things will just be will just work out of the box. So, we have a what, what we've done is created and uh, you know collaboratively created this fairly large library of um, of different dashboards and metrics and things like that uh, for all aspects of the of the life cycle. So, uh, you know, looking at quality, looking at sort of um, agile um, sort of metrics and tracking things like uh, sort of burn down and things like that, um, and then looking at more in the sort of um, APM space, so application performance and also um, examples of things for, run, for running hypotheses in production. So experimenting into production and, and having dashboards for all that kind of uh, thing. So we created a catalog and, um, and the sort of wider firm also created something called My Wizard, which brings in uh, what we call intelligent automation. So uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, they have a uh, sort of whole category of, of things like automated agents or uh, requirements analysis um, uh, tools or, um, or, or I guess tests or, or things like automated ticket assignment and all that kind of stuff. And because we've sort of helped um, to some extent, I don't want to say standardized, but we've given people the opportunity to be more similar with their DevOps tools, it gives us the opportunity to then plug into things like this. So we, we of course um, can send data to instances of this and, and then people get um, you know, they then tap into all the work with machine learning that people have been doing. So sort of you know, nice side effects by, by operating like this. Um, so the last thing is, is sort of people. So scale, knowledge, inclination, culture, skills. Uh, you know, how have we sort of uh, scaled that um, to make sure that that is um, um, you know, definitely not the bottleneck and, uh, and definitely um, you know, doesn't get in the way of, of scaling a DevOps adoption? So, of course, uh, you know, as you'd expect, 
lots of things like training. We kind of um, operate like an internal consultant consultancy, so making our um, people available to teams to help them. Um, we operate a dojo, which I'll come on to, and we've got various toolkits. So a typical example of a, a training course, we want really people of all levels to get hands-on to this, and that's very key. We made a, a, a training course which um, is two days, which is you know, hard to get some people on if they're very senior, of course, but, um, and for that reason we have a one-day version. Um, we've actually taken um, nearly 50,000 people in our organisation and, and some clients, but mainly our organisation, um, through this course. And it gets them hands-on um, from the, within the first hour. So they're provisioning Jenkins, they're provisioning uh, ADOP, and so they're starting to experience pipelines firsthand and the concepts of continuous integration and drilling down and traceability and all that sort of stuff um, is, in, is sort of put in their hands. So, we do a day of continuous delivery, we do a day of environments, so sort of going down the stack. And people leave with the ability to, I mean, they, they know they can go and get this stuff from us, but they also know, um, providing they've got a cloud account, they know they can provision this stuff for themselves to continue their journey. So very much, um, you know, the uh, sort of scaling has been driven by people being hands-on and, and autonomous. I mentioned we do a dojo, that's the trendy word uh, for, um, for having people come to the uh, the DevOps uh, shared group, the MyDAS, we call it, and um, then they get to bring their own automation. Maybe they'll do some training, but we'll also pair with them and, and partner with them and work on their own uh, automation so that they leave with improved scripts or some pipelines or some missing sort of pieces in the, in the jigsaw puzzle that they needed um, to continue on their own. So it's another way of sort of scaling our um, ability to help people on the journey. So um, I'll touch on a few toolkits. So um, cloud security um, is extremely important, and uh, we've got this thing which we sort of tend to call CHTK for, an, for the sake of an acronym, Cloud Hardening Toolkit. And this is the, the, the security goals here are not just to create safe things, so you know build safe systems. Of course, that's very important, but it's also to make sure people are safe whilst they're building them. So. It's very um, easy to, put, to give people cloud access and power that they you know, never could have uh, conceived of before when they were working in uh, sort of private data centers. And it's very important for their productivity to give them this kind of cloud level of uh, autonomy over things. But we also have to make sure we're doing it safely at speed. So the, uh, the cloud hardening toolkit is um, designed to, um, there's, a, there's a big ed education component for people and there's actually an exam that I make people take before they can touch cloud accounts that I own, just to make sure that we're kind of all clear on the basics of what's going on. And you might think, you know, this is, if it's just test environments, what are the problems here? But there's problems. I mean, um, it may not have production data. It may not have, um, you know, actual production um, uh, access, you know, maybe completely isolated. But you're going to have source code in there. You're going to have intellectual property. You're going to have secrets. And, Someone is ideating or experimenting or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know what part of the stack they're tweaking. Maybe they're trying to look at the logs. If they provision something that's vulnerable and it's compromised, then you've, um, of course, you may be losing things like compute and people might be stealing your resources to mine cryptocurrency on their brand new blockchain. Um, but also, um, they could be, um, they, they've got access to your secrets and source code and things that you didn't want them to have. So education. Um, controls and standards, so actually saying you know, what to put on the internet and what not to, um, how, ways to harden the cloud account, so least, least privilege and all that kind of stuff, and um, lots of accelerators that we've built for things like hardening, you know, creating things secure from the start, creating them secure by default. And then uh, we, we use uh, Security Monkey, which is one of the uh, Netflix um, uh, sort of Chaos Monkey family. And uh, we use that for continuously scanning metadata from cloud accounts and looking at things that are being provisioned and comparing them against our set of standards. And then um, obviously putting this stuff in Splunk or, some, or Elk for uh, reporting. And, and also in a sort of chat ops kind of way, telling people, just sending them alerts, sending it straight to the team, saying, you provision something which is on the internet and doesn't appear to be of a hardened uh, machine image. Or um, you've created something else, uh, like a, uh, you've got an AP, you created an API key and uh, you shouldn't have done that or um, for your policies or, um, or, or be aware that someone's done that, that kind of thing. So again, you know, toolkits that we've sort of 
uh, open sourced internally um, to make it as easy as possible for people to be safe and, uh, and sort of standardized. Next one is around uh, culture. So obviously, you know, very, very difficult thing uh, to scale and, uh, and influence remotely. Um, but a sort of very key thing that we found uh, on every uh, DevOps journey is around, uh, you know, what we call like blameless root cause analysis or sort of safe environments. So we created a, a sort of methodology for what we use ourselves around um, how to kind of keep the um, level of safety up in, when you're doing learning reviews and sort of maximize the impact. Um, and make sure that you know, you're not creating a, you're not doing your team damage by trying to get to the bottom of things. You're not kind of causing people to close down and cover up uh, what's been going wrong. You're actually making it as easy as possible for, um, to get to the bottom of things and to learn and to share back, you know, perhaps, um, perhaps much more widely. So um, we've sort of blogged some of this stuff. We'll send the slides out. You don't need to write the link down. Um, some of this stuff is out there. So, so finally, um, you know, it's very difficult sort of scaling uh, this stuff and, uh, and being with, uh, involved with teams that you don't ever meet. So, um, or, or, you know, if there are teams we don't meet. So psychological safety is the last thing that we kind of thought um, or recognized was really, really important. So if you haven't heard of it, it's, it basically describes sort of how safe someone feels uh, in front of their team to express some doubt, to, um, to raise a question, to say they don't understand, or uh, maybe even to contradict them. So if people don't have that level of safety, then they're sitting there closed down, being spoke over, uh, maybe, you know, maybe by the senior people, and they are really not going to be, um, as a, we're not going to be as effective as a team, we're not going to learn, and we're not going to improve at the rate that we should. So, uh, and, and there was probably some of you read, Google did a study, and they looked at the, the leading indicators on high-performing teams, and um, they looked at things like academic background, experience, uh, how long the team's been together, things like that. And they found that psychological safety was the leading indicator. So the safer a, a, a team felt, um, the higher performing they'd be as a team. So we read a blog by uh, someone called Stephen Smith. Uh, I'm sure you can find him on Twitter. And um, it was excellent. He talked about psychological safety. He also gave us some practical advice um, and a sort of way of measuring it um, by sort of doing a sort of quick vote um, in terms of how safe people felt and, uh, and using that as a tool for assessing it. And so we, we just made a simple, a very simple app. We had a sort of hackathon on these things. Um, and there's an app that we'll have a look at now to try this, because um, it was a lot easier to create this than it was to sort of explain to people how to do it. How to do it. And um, you know, it's one of our ways of sort of trying to improve safety. So uh, welcome to Joe again. So you can get your phones out. I mean, of course, you can get your phones out. But uh, if you want to um, vote, then this is what you do. So we're going to ask Joe to vote now uh, how, how safe he feels so, uh, in this situation. I'm in a room full of people, uh, <laughs> so not the most comfortable. So I might put something like a, a three. Not, wow. It's not you, it's me. It's not you. It's wow, me. That's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty safe. Uh, uh, oh, is it? Oh, well. So if you want to try this um, and you want to vote, you need to go to the, this custom link that we have here. Uh, so two, uh, lowercase s, v, o, r, d, in lowercase again, and then A. OK, cool. Wow, thank you. Good participation. Um, so yeah, so what we've seen is that the average safety is, is 3, which is kind of OK. You know, it goes from 0 to 4. So it shows that we don't have a sort of you know, treacherous uh, kind of environment here. Um, but also, um, it, does, it does say uh, here that uh, someone voted, or one person voted 0. So, um, and also, we can see you know, it's. The, perhaps the majority of the room is okay, but actually there's, there's, a, there's a reasonable portion. I, I can't do the, uh, the numbers, but there's you know, something like 20% are, are not quite so comfortable. So, so what you don't do at this point, of course, is go, right, who voted zero? <laughs> Was it you? Um, that is a very quick way of, um, of eroding the safety uh, massively. So you've got to respond very, very carefully, and if you want this thing to ever work more than once. Um, and actually, you know, it probably does get better over time. When this happens, you've now got an opportunity to have a think. And there's, you know, there's some advice here. There's some advice on the, the person's blog as well um, about you know, maybe someone who's quite senior in the room is maybe um, kind of creating a dynamic they're not really expecting they are, and maybe they ought to leave. Uh, maybe you want to um, um, try and have an open conversation about what the kind of uh, you know, elephant might be in the room. Or maybe, you want to, maybe the meeting's just too big. Or maybe um, 
um, you know, various different things that could be causing people to, um, to feel like they're not in a safe environment. They're not able to share, they're not able to kind of get their, sort of be bring their best selves to the, to the, um, to the conversation. And um, you know, we found over time, um, this, this has been a, 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 you know, great for our team in terms of improving um, how we're collaborating and you know, we hear good things back from uh, other people. So, and of course, the, the, the important thing about this is um, it creates an inclusive environment and um, you know, hopefully an inclusive environment is, um, is going to be an environment which is better for having a diverse environment and um, you know, hopefully you know, creating a, a, at least being able to retain, create and retain a diverse environment. And that's obviously you know, absolutely vital to our industry, um, even more than DevOps. So um, you know, it goes beyond um, uh, sort of DevOps when we're trying to scale DevOps adoption and trying to, trying to scale uh, you know, great places to work. So yeah, that was my sort of uh, whistle-stop tour across some of the things that we've used to take aspects of sort of highly successful DevOps and scale them in a, in a giant uh, organization, working to empower and enable them um, you know, rather than kind of constrain them, but also balancing uh, safety um, um, and an acceptable level of risk with speed. Um, of course, i um, love to work with you. So um, if you want to come and talk to me, I'll be around all day. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.